Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, each one, for joining the class. Let's take a moment to pray and we'll get started. May I request somebody to please pray with the class? We can pray. Let's start. Anyone can pray? Precious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this wonderful day which you have given to us. We thank you once again, Father God, in your wisdom and grace, Father God, we ask you to fill us and, Father God, prepare our heart, prepare our mind, prepare everything, oh, Father God, so that everything what we are going to learn, oh, Father God, we can able to store it, and, Father God, we can make it fruitful for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray that, Father God, that, Lord, Master, strengthen your servant, and Lord Master, that everything what He is going to release, let it be from Your wisdom and from Your spirit, from Your revelation. We thank You and praise You, Father God, for this wonderful time. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you once again for joining. So this is our course on media and technology, and um, as I shared uh, last week. Um, our goal is to cover a wide spectrum, um, both in the media space and technology space, and look at how these things can be used, how media and technology can be used in the ministry. Uh, and at the same, uh, so there will be, you know, as we get started initially, we'll talk a little bit today. Again, the class will be a little bit about, you know, a biblical perspective. But then from tomorrow onwards, We'll start looking at uh, the actual contemporary things that are going on uh, um, in various aspects in the preaching of the word and the way the the the, the venue where the services are held and the, then we get into all the details of the equipment and so on and so forth. So the goal, uh, as I mentioned last class, is to give us um, sufficient information uh, so that when we have to make decisions. Um, you know, we will be able to engage meaningfully and make uh, useful decisions. So at least we'll know how to go about uh, making those decisions. Um, today, I just want to cover two parts, two, two areas um, as we um, talk about this. One is we want to talk about methods, contemporary methods in ministry and then we also want to establish a little bit of some guidelines when we use contemporary methods or changing methods so we i think we all agree that the world around us is changing uh, like we saw last week we looked at some data you know we can tell you know more and more people are spending time online they're spending time with devices they're spending time on social media platforms and they're engaging with each other digitally in 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 in, in an increasing manner and uh, the digital world has given us the advantage of being connected so we could literally you know we are literally connected with billions of people globally digitally through the internet we are, we are connected. And so it gives us all of these advantages. So the world we are living in is changing. It's very different. Uh, and so we need to think about these things. We need to look at the tools, the resources, and we need to be open to using them, using the contemporary methods and tools uh, to bring the message, the gospel, and the message of God's word to people. We shouldn't shy away from it. Uh, we shouldn't stay away from it. But we should say, look, let's use it. Let's engage with people using these tools. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time to impress that upon us. I don't think um, any one of us would hesitate in doing so. That, look, we, we should. I think we'll all, we are all in agreement that we should use tools, resources, and methods that are currently available. And when we look at scripture, and I'm just looking at, you know, First Corinthians, this passage, First Corinthians 9, 
19 to 22, uh, where we talk, where Paul shares his own approach to the proclamation of the gospel. You know, he says, look, he is a debtor. He is compelled to preach the gospel, to take it to as many people as, and I'm just paraphrasing that, to take the gospel to as many people. But while he's doing that, he also mentions his approach. He says, you know, I, I, I become, I, I relate to the people that I'm ministering to. To the Jew, I become like a Jew. To the Gentile, I become like a Gentile, meaning those who are outside the, the law of God. I become like them. And yet I, I don't live dishonorably. I myself don't violate the law of God, even though those people that I might reach are not living under God's law, uh, I go reach them while keeping myself under the law of God. He says, to the weak, I become like the weak. And he says, I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. You know, so what's he telling us? He's, he's giving us a very important understanding about the approach we take in bringing the gospel to people. He says, essentially, if you, if you have to sum up what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-22, he says, look, let's get into people's worlds. Let's relate to them in a way that they understand. Uh, let's go there. Let's become like them without, of course, violating the law of God in order to communicate the gospel to them. Right? Now, if we translate what Paul taught from 1 Corinthians 9, 19-22 to our day, here we are 2,000 years later, the tools, the methods have evolved, have changed. Uh, we have media, we have technology, we've got lots of opportunity. So, from Paul's understanding, he's encouraging us, use it. Get into people's worlds. Do what you can to get into where they are, to connect with them, to become like them. And then, of course, you don't step out of what is pleasing God. Don't step out of that. But staying within that, you get into people's worlds and then communicate the gospel to them. Right? So we. Uh, we must be open, ready, uh, we must be equipped to use contemporary methods in Christian ministry. And what are the advantages of doing that? Well, I just put down four here. One is, you know, it helps us be relevant. That means we can speak to people in ways that they understand. Uh, we are able to connect with them. You know, for example, if you use media, we are using technology, a lot of people especially in urban contexts, they are very uh, engaged digitally. So we are able to speak to them in, a, in ways that they can understand. Uh, it gives us greater reach. We can go where people are. We can reach more people in less time. We could even enter into people's private spaces without being or, you know, without being intrusive in that sense. That means, you know, you're not banging on the door and telling them, telling them to open up the front door and you're coming into the living room, and yet you can still get into their living room uh, in a very, very quiet way through the use of media and technology. So you can actually get into their spaces and communicate to them in a way that they will be willing to receive. So it increases our reach. It also helps us be responsive, so um, we can respond more quickly to people and to their needs. And you know, I uh, I just been doing some learning uh, about uh, artificial intelligence and how AI is being used in other industries. For you know, uh, and, and 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 you know whether it's in the banking or in retail, so on, and and how. You know how amazing it is that they're looking at AI. Of course, AI, AI machine learning is, is 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 based on you know you're, you're processing huge amounts of data which you've been able to collect, and then 
you're using all of that and you're using uh, the ability that we have in machine learning and uh, neural networks and so on to respond to people sometimes uh, not only respond but maybe even be proactive in reaching out to people in serving people now of course they are doing it from a business perspective whether it's a banking or a retail or whatever industry they use it they look at it from a responsiveness from a business perspective but i was thinking you know hey how do i translate that into what we are doing in christian ministry you know what if example you know some ideas you know what which i would love to implement but thinking about it the example you know now we all everybody knows about chat gpt you go then you ask a question and it pulls in from a world of information and gives you a response very intelligent response now uh, now if somebody comes to our church website to search for something uh, it just gives a search result page with just a list of links, you know, like what Google normally does. It kind of gives, okay, here are all the links that kind of match your keywords, the search phrase. But what if we give a response like how ChatGPT would give? That is, we, we enable people to search like that and give them a very intelligent response. If somebody comes and says, you know, you know, healing and deliverance, and so rather than, rather than giving links to all the artifacts, the items we have on healing and deliverance what if you give them a nice paragraph that explains what healing and deliverance is of course you know you, you take it out of the content that we have get them nice and then you give them okay and here are the things that you can here are some sermons you can listen to here are some books you can read for healing and deliverance that would be such a much better way to respond and a much better in interaction that we have with people now that we can and now that is possible and it's possible to do that the technology is already there, right? Uh, now we just have to implement it, uh, you know, for us. And like that, you know, with artificial intelligence, we can do so much more to, with with the data we have uh, to serve people and so on. So uh, being responsive, responding to people, their needs, uh, it enables us to do that uh, more quickly, you know, um, uh, th and thank God for technology. People, you know, constantly keep getting these WhatsApp messages for prayer requests and whatever. It keeps coming. Uh, it, it has made us, you know, more connected, and we can quickly respond to people's needs. You know, imagine in the days when they didn't have phone, somebody had a need, they'll have to send word through somebody else that somebody else would have to physically travel to go meet the pastor and say, Pastor, you know, so and so out there is in this situation can you come and help but today they just send a whatsapp message send a message or a call and you know we're able to respond to needs so much faster so uh, you know we can use technology and use you know these tools available to be more responsive to care for people and also i think uh, it helps us be respectful for people that is we can give people the opportunity to explore in whatever way you prefer, you know. That way, somebody, if somebody wants to explore about the Christian faith, you know, they can come without anybody forcing anything on them. Example, they can go to a, some website, a church website or something. Uh, they can listen to whatever video they want or a sermon they want or read a book that they would like to and take their own time and without being forced they can explore you know so i think it's a very respectful way of letting people explore the christian faith without being forced to make a decision right here right now kind of thing take your time here are all the resources available use what you want um, listen to what you want watch what you want read what you want and make a decision so um, the use of contemporary methods for Christian ministry has a lot of benefits and advantages uh, on this, right? So uh, let me just pause you and see if uh, you know if anybody wants to add any thoughts to this. You know uh, about using contemporary methods for ministry. Uh, everyone's okay so far. You're all comfortable. Does anybody have any objection? to using contemporary methods in ministry. 
what 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 could be some of the negatives and i i I've kind of i've spoken from a very positive point of view uh uh but what could be some of the negatives when we use these contemporary tools uh, that are available anyway i'm just just opening up for discussion that's all Uh, Pastor, I think so many old people uh, does not know how to handle these things because only the youngsters or the people yeah. there about the technology. That is very possible. good, very good. That's a very important point, right? That there, there, there is a generation who are not comfortable. You know, I'm, of course, some people learn and some people. There is a generation; they, they may not be comfortable. They want. They want to see you in person. They want to talk to you in person. Uh, they may not know. They may not be comfortable uh, engaging with technology and connecting in such ways, right? So we we must be very mindful of that. And that's a very valid point. Okay, good. Anything else, you know, that we can think about the negatives? And I, I was very forceful on the positives, uh, but what could be some of the drawbacks of using contemporary methods? So, um, Pastor, my, so how do we how do we um, use the contemporary method to do ministry and be effective in it? Same time, without losing focus on that generation that are not comfortable in using these contemporary methods. How do we keep a balance between the two? Mm, mm, very good. So I think we need to have both kinds of ministries going on. You know, that is, yes, we, we will use these tools and uh, methods, but we also engage in person, one-on-one, -on -one, the way, you know, that generation, is comfortable uh, relating to and expecting to be ministered to, right? So we need to have both. We cannot just, uh, if we go all out only on one direction, we will lose out. We won't be able to minister to them. So uh, there are people who prefer, you know, just listening in person and so on and so forth. Uh, they want you to come. They want you to sit and talk. And so we need to be willing to do that. So as a church or as a ministry, we must do that. Don't cut that off completely. And also, we, while we are doing this media and technology space work, so we need to do both. And I think uh, finding the balance there, you know, uh, is very important. Uh, both uh, using media and te technology uh, gives us some advantage, gives a lot of advantage, but then we must also continue to serve them, the older generation or the generation that's not comfortable in person, being there for them, so on. Uh, I'm seeing Abraham's comment here. Mm, the, if the world system does not influence the activities of the church, yes, Abraham, that's true. And that's going to be our next point that we will talk about is how do we protect that, right? Uh, Roshan, I see. Um, Media and technology is a great way to reach new people and they can connect with us then one on one. Yeah. So definitely media and technology gives us this this great reach, the opportunity to reach people beyond uh, so okay, so let's uh, get into the next point that I just wanted to talk about, which is so while we are aware of you know the fact that yeah, yes we should be using contemporary methods, I think very important is we must put some guidelines for ourselves. You know when we are using these methods, the changing methods, uh, and 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 I've just you know listed out some guidelines just just to you know help us remember these things or think about these things. You know, yes, um, using changing methods is helping us be relevant. 
that means I am, we are communicating the message through a medium and in a manner that connects with people in today's world, a good portion, a large population of people. So we are being relevant, and that's one of our big motivations in using media and technology, I understood. But while we are doing that, it's very important that we do not compromise in the message. That's the first thing that we need to be very careful of. The audience is telling us, hey, come to me through this medium, because I am there. Fine, fair enough. But the audience must not dictate what we tell them. And that's the danger that we must avoid. Right? So the audience is telling us, hey, you come to me on social media, you come to me through videos, or you come to me through whatever medium that they are willing to consume content on. Yes, that's fine. But the audience should not dictate what we should be speaking to them. Now the danger is, uh, which you know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not blaming the whole church world or anything, but we can see in some places that while there has been a, a movement to use contemporary methods, in some cases the message has also been compromised. Why? Because in an attempt to reach a certain audience through a certain medium, they were not careful in keeping the authenticity of the message or the integrity of the message. So the message got compromised because of the whole passion with which they were trying to reach that particular audience. So for example, if, uh, um, if there's a certain group of people whom I could reach, uh, you know, through creating interesting videos and all of that, okay, that's fine. Let's create those videos, let's communicate the message. But if in order to reach that particular group, I start saying what they are comfortable with instead of saying what the Bible tells me to tell them, then I have begun to compromise the message. So, example, if I want to reach uh, the uh, LGBTQ community, now that's a tough part, or I can bring the message of love, because God does tell us to love everybody, so we love them as people. But at some point, I have to speak up and say, this is what the Bible says. God made man and woman. God made you male, and God made you female. And there is there's, there's nothing else. There's no other way the Bible presents his creation to us, right? And what is sin? I have to call it a sin. While I say God loves you, God hates sin. God hates this kind of lifestyle, or God hates anything that is going against his original design. And that has to be communicated in love, but we have to speak the truth in love. Right? We can't dilute the truth. So in an effort to reach a particular community, yes, I can you know, reach them through a medium that they may be comfortable with, but we need to present the truth. We're not going to condemn them. We're not, we're not here to condemn them. Or judge them, but we need to present the truth. Similarly, you know, we'll have different audiences, okay, but I cannot compromise the message. I can use methods that will help us reach them, perfectly fine, but the message always comes from the scripture. And so I put, you know, 1 Corinthians 1 18 to 25 here, just to point out that, you know, when Paul is talking about his audience, he says, the Jews require a sign, 
the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Now that's Paul is saying, look, in my audience, the Jewish people, they want science, they want something spectacular, they want something supernatural. And then I, there are the Greeks, they want something very intellectually stimulating, they want things that appeal to their mind. But to the Jews and to the Greeks, that means whoever is in my audience, I have only one message, and it is Christ crucified. That's the message. Right? So it's a very powerful passage here in 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25, that Paul is telling us, look, we preach one message, Christ crucified, we preach the cross, and what God did for us through Christ on the cross. Right? The third thing, uh, guideline, uh, or the next guideline, while we're trying to be relevant, the next guideline when you're using changing methods is to keep stay pure in our motivation. And this is again very, very important. Because when we start using contemporary methods, remember the world has its way of evaluating the effectiveness of some of these methods. And uh, all of us are very familiar, you know, uh, if you're on Instagram or YouTube, you're looking at the number of followers or number of subscribers, uh, or if you have a post, you're looking at the number of views, you're looking at the number of likes or shares or you know you're, you're looking at those kinds of metrics right so those are there uh, they are useful but that shouldn't become our motivation our motivation while we are using all of these contemporary methods tools etc is not to get into the game of the same metrics that the world is using or the metrics that are there but our motivation is we're going to glorify god right we are here to glorify god okay so that must be very clear to us and it is something that we must be very careful of because these same metrics then begin to become a point of competition okay how many subscribers do you have how many followers do you have how many views do you get per whatever you know per video whatever and and, and then because a point of competition between christian ministers right so what has happened okay you're using a platform you're using tools and medium to reach people okay but now we are using those metrics to see who is doing better, who has got a bigger reach, who's, you know, so on and so forth. Now, some of these metrics, you know, generally we would refer to them as vanity metrics, meaning they're not genuine. For example, you know that, you know, on YouTube, if, you, if a view is just, if somebody views your video for maybe like 30 seconds and if it's if it's an ad it's five seconds so if you're running an ad somebody watches your ad for five seconds it's counted as a view uh, if you have a video and somebody watches it for 30 seconds it's counted as a view um, so it doesn't mean they watch the whole video they just they watch 30 seconds of the video and it's added as a view or they watch five seconds of your ad it's counted as a view your ad may be 30 seconds if they watch the five seconds it's not it's counted as view so you don't even know if they actually got the message right but if you just look at the view count so oh, so many people viewed no maybe they didn't you know so that view count itself is not a true indicator of any kind of impact or any kind of reach it's just a number which may not give an accurate picture you know, yeah, yes, it's nice to have lots of views, but we don't know. I mean, you'll have to drill a little deeper. You have to go into the analytics to see what duration of the video was actually watched by how many people. But if you just look at the views, it gives you no indicator of how many people actually watched the entire video or got the message, you know. So, so these metrics that we have, we have to be very careful. Don't let that become. Uh, a focus, right? 
our focus must be always glorify God and serve people well. How do you serve them well? Well, enrich, equip, and empower them. You're serving them well. That's it. So keep that as the motivation. Right? Um, here, I'm going to use these tools. I'm going to use these methods. But the motivation is, Lord, I want to glorify you by serving the people well. I'll do the best we can. So that they can, people can be equipped and enriched and empowered. We're not going to get into these competition and the games of, you know, the things that, that come along with using these tools and methods. Okay. So that's a, that's an important guideline to keep as we engage with these modern tools and methods and so on and so forth. You know, and uh, in the way we do our graphics, in the way we produce our videos, sometimes you know, with video, you can, you can just uh, make things look so great and grand, uh, and it, it can, you know, you can actually create completely, completely different picture from reality. Right. So, example, if somebody's reporting on a meeting that that was held. Um, the way a video is produced to report on that meeting could leave the impression that there were hundreds and thousands of people who are greatly impacted and so on and so forth. Whereas actually they may have just been 15 people in that place. You know, so you could actually create a video reporting on that meeting, leaving a very different impression from what actually took place. So the integrity of that production is totally determined determined by the person doing it, right? So we're using a tool, we're using a medium, but that medium, how we use it is in our control. And we must always use it in a way that glorifies God. It does good to people. It's, there's integrity in, in how we use it, how we use that medium. So that brings us to the next guideline, which is uh, you know, uh, for us to be blameless in our conduct. That is, uh, the, the use of this medium should make sure that we conduct ourselves in an honorable way. And again, I, I understand there is a gray area here, meaning what may be acceptable to some may be discounted by others in the Christian, I'm talking about the Christian church, within the Christian world. And uh, what may be accepted in one part of the world may be disregarded in another part of the world uh, because of cultural differences. So we need to be very culturally sensitive. We need to be, we need to choose a, a, an approach that um, will be blameless. For example, the next topic we're going to talk about is preaching, the ministry of the word. We'll pick it up tomorrow, but I'm just uh, mentioning this. So in the ministry of the word, if you look at how the ministry of the word has changed, uh, today, you know, preachers can come on the pulpit. So, okay, when you go in time past, and we'll talk more on this tomorrow. Uh, in time past, the preaching of the word was held with so much reverence, right? How you dressed? You 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 dressed very very formally. Um, you you spoke very formally, uh, very reverent. There was a lot of reverence in the ministry of the word. You compare it to today, and I'm not saying everybody's doing this, but what is happening in the contemporary church is, you know, you can have a preacher who comes up uh, with uh, torn jeans and you know uh, torn shirt, and I'm not. Against all of that, I mean, if you, somebody wants to wear torn, uh, torn jeans, that's their choice. I, I don't care; it, it doesn't affect me. But I'm just saying what we what what's happening in the contemporary church. So you can have a preacher come in just totally different attire, and the language of communication will be very casual. Sometimes um, it may even border of being vulgar. You know, being sort of hey, you're very close to being. 
dirty in communication. But, you know, the audience claps and you've got thousands of people listening to the preacher. But the language in which the word of God is being communicated is bordering on being very out of place. But it's happening. And there are thousands of people listening to such preaching. So where do you draw the line? You know, how do we... We'll talk and discuss this tomorrow. I'm just giving an example here in being blameless in our conduct while we are being contemporary, while we are appealing to people in our generation, and while we're communicating God's truth uh, to our generation. We must consciously choose to be blameless in how we conduct ourselves. Uh, a, a, while we are trying to be relevant and contemporary. Okay, more on more discussions as we get into the details of preaching styles and so on. And finally, our, our another guideline, very important guideline is: look, our goal is lasting fruit. Okay, Jesus said in John fifteen sixteen, "I've chosen you so that your fruit should remain." You know, in Matthew seven, he said, "You will know a tree." by its fruit, right? So our goal is to, to go for lasting fruit, enduring fruit. What do we mean by that? We mean, by, we mean that while we are trying to be relevant to contemporary audience and we're using what is available, we're not trying just trying to excite people or give them a good feeling or give them or just hype up their emotion. No. We are looking at seeing lives changed to become Christ-like. That's the lasting fruit. So example, if you, we will talk about this in, in another chapter. When you look at the con contemporary church setting, you know, in times past, they had these, of course, people met in homes. And then we came up with these church buildings, which are very sacred places and today in there are venues church service venues which are all lights and blitz and you know we've got our led projectors led screens and uh smoke machines and lights and all of that okay that's all there now we're using all of these tools and things that we can to make that service an uh, exciting experience. But is our objective just to excite the crowd when they come, give them a wow experience? Or is our objective in seeing them become disciples of Jesus Christ, in seeing, them, seeing their lives changed into Christ-likeness? Okay? You want to use LED panels? Yeah, those are tools we have today. You want to use a nice stage? You want to use some color lights? You know, if that's useful to your audience, it gets their attention, okay. But what are we looking for? Are we looking just for hype and emotion and excitement, a good experience, or are we looking for lasting fruit? So, what are the questions we need to ask ourselves? Don't compromise the message. Keep your motivation pure. Be blameless in your conduct. And look for or focus on lasting fruit. So, I would present these four points here as, as some guidelines. Right? So, let me pause here. Let's take up some questions and discussion here uh, as we talk about these things. Uh, yes, Christopher, your hand is raised. Please ask your question. Uh, yes, Pastor, thank you. Um, I was just, um, you know, going through the, um, you know, these points. And, um, you know, in the guidelines, I mean, I can understand, um, uh, you know, um, how points like relevant no compromise in the message, um, 
blameless, C class include, these all have, in a sense, you know, uh, a reference point, um, maybe in the Bible, um, or maybe, you know, for example, in the case of relevant, uh, it could be pertaining to, uh, you know, what, what is currently going, uh, happening in the world. Um, and in some ways, um, you know, these can be, um, these can be measurable. Um, and you know you, you could actually build a kind of a metric around it. Uh, so, for example, no compromise in the message. Uh, you know, if if uh, if there are messages that uh, you know that do, uh, that are not uh, biblical, for example, then you know that means that that is a message that's outside the boundaries of uh, of you know what should be should be right as per the Bible. And um, in a sense, a, a metric could be uh, could be set up against that particular guideline. Um, what I was trying to come, uh, you know, trying to understand was that you know, in the case of pure and motivation, motivation to glory glorify God. Yes, again, that can also, you know, we could could actually uh, build a kind of a metric around that. Uh, but to, the, I guess to, to serve people well, to enrich, equip, and empower people. But when a message is actually put across, um, how that could be measured, or how how that can can you know sort of uh, translate into some kind of a metric, I was just trying to understand that. So I just thought I'll bring that to that point and uh, you know ask you your view on that. Mm. So just around that point, I was just trying to understand that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Um, maybe I'll just share a little bit about you know, a struggle I had recently. So at the beginning of this year, uh, I, I I wanted to preach, and I just felt in my heart, to share three sermons. One was on habits and routines, and the second two were messages on planning and life plan and so on. So the struggle I had was, Okay, I know these things are going to help people. But I also know that these kinds of messages are can be preached by you know people who do these self-help uh, motivation type of messages. They don't have, you don't have to be a Christian to talk about habits, routines or planning. <laughs> You don't have to be a Christian to do that. So meaning there is a certain element here which is very natural. It's not spiritual. Which and you know, people outside the church are already doing. There are a lot of things on that. So for me, uh, I, I wanted to help people because I know that these things are helpful to people. Yeah, it's always helpful to have good habits and good routines and to have plan and all that. It's a helpful thing, right? So that's where, that's the uh, serving well, equipping, empowering part. But the question I had to ask myself before I prepared these sermons was, hey, is it really biblical? Is it in the Bible? Is, is, is this something God is telling us to do, right? Now, I personally, I know I was motivated through scripture in my own personal life. Um, and that's how I developed, and you know, so uh, I, I knew I was very convinced that these things are very biblical because over the last several decades, that's how I have lived. That I was motivated from scripture in these areas. Uh, I was, you know, um, let's say, helped by the Holy Spirit in these areas. So, although these topics are very, are topics that anybody outside in the world can talk about. Uh, and these topics are helpful to people. For me, an important criteria was, hey, is it really coming from God? Is it really coming from the scriptures? Only then I have to communicate it. And I have to be careful that I bring it with a biblical perspective, not from you know a, a general self-help, self motivational speaker type perspective, you know? So, in preparing these three sermons, I struggled with this. Struggled means I had to consciously be careful. 
okay? So I think this is, for me, you know, kind of in response to what you said, where, yes, the motivation is to help people, it is to empower them, it is to equip them, because all, you know, talking about habits and planning and routines, yeah, it helps them. But at the same time, because it is being preached in church from the pulpit, it has to come from the scriptures. It has to come from the word of God. Otherwise, I have no right, no, I, I shouldn't waste people's time, you know, just giving a motivational talk on these things. Uh, did I address your question? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yes, I mean, I think it has comes back to the it comes back to the motivation. Uh, where I was coming from was actually, um, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, relating it to uh, maybe just a very you know basic, uh, uh, you know, or important uh, management sort of uh, speak around. Uh, you know, if it if it cannot be, um, you know, if it cannot be measured, then you know, uh, you cannot, uh, uh, you know, you really don't know where you are. Uh, sort of you know um uh, you can't manage it in sense you can't really you know uh you know be able to ensure that you know it, 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 you know the kind of one is progressing um so um all the other ones i felt were you know uh were, measurable uh, oh. measurable and the um but this one seemed to be uh, uh you know um didn't seem to have enough um you know i guess um yeah, I mean, for example, I mean, I'm just uh, giving an example. You know, if if in a church service, you know, and um, we are we are, uh, you know, the pastor is 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 um, um, asking people if you know anyone wants to you know accept um, uh, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We know that in that particular, uh, you know, uh, service, uh, you know, one person or ten people have have accepted, and so that is that is that in, in a sense is a measurable thing. This one about serving people well uh, seemed to be a, didn't seem seemed to be a little bit uh, I don't know it didn't uh, didn't seem to resonate too well. Uh, mm. you know, we able to from a measurable point of view, yeah, that's right. Mm. Mm. Okay, yeah. So I think uh, yeah, uh, I, I would say that yeah, it's something you know it has to do with our heart. Yeah, it's true we can't measure it, but we check upon ourselves saying you know am i doing this right am i is my motivation uh to really help people and build people up and it's just true you cannot measure it and because you don't know somebody's heart we don't know their motivation yeah that's true okay so uh just to sum up today's uh class so as we now we are going to, from next class onwards, we're going to start getting into all the practical things. Uh, we'll start off by talking about, you know, contemporary preaching, contemporary stage, venue, and then get into all those things that media and technology does. But there's this, oh, today's class mainly is, yes, we all agree we should use, sorry, we should use the tools and technologies available because of the benefits they give us. We must not neglect those who may not be there using these tools and technologies. So we need to be mindful of that segment of people and care for them as well. And while we are engaging with contemporary tools, technologies, media, we need to stay within certain guidelines. Um, some of these are very obvious, which is like uh, Chris was pointing out, you know, you know when you're preaching the message, you compromise the message, or you can tell when, you know, uh, your the the intent is to glorify God, and uh, when it is honorable. So we stay within these guidelines. We maintain proper conduct, and then we use these tools, methods, and tools in a very careful way to serve people. So while we progress. These questions will come up. You know, we will intensely ask uh, what we are seeing in the contemporary church. Is that okay? Is that not, not okay? Where should we be careful? We'll keep asking this question. You know, tomorrow we'll talk about preaching. Uh, how preaching has changed so much, both in the content, in the delivery, and in the 
other aspects that go along with preaching. It has changed so much. What are what is okay? What is not okay? That's something we can talk about and discuss. All right, and then like that, we'll pick up topic by topic, get into various things. All right. Thank you, everybody. Let's pray, and uh, we will close. I look forward to a lot of uh, uh, discussion uh, in this course as we talk about these things. Right. Could somebody close in prayer, and we'll go forward. We'll dismiss. Anybody could close that in prayer. Every pastor. Please go ahead. God, thank you, Lord, for this class, Lord. Thank you that we got to learn about the media and technology. And God, whatever we learn, we may understand in depth uh, that we had learned it in a way that your future calling or whatever you have for us, God. I thank you so much, Lord, for each one of the students that as they have learned, may they go with um, understanding and wisdom, God. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Ashish. We pray in your name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you all tomorrow. God bless. Bye now.